Hello, and welcome to this episode of a Clean Bill of Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Galen Nuttall, and I have a quick question before we hop on over to the episode. Did you know that many physicians are overpaying taxes due to not leveraging their corporation effectively? I've seen cases where a physician is on track to lose out on millions of dollars in retirement because they're not using their corporation effectively. And if you are unsure, if you are making the most of the unique entity that is the professional corporation, creating a plan with me and my team of corporate planning experts might be a good move. If you're interested in a plan that shows you how to make the most of your corporation, save on taxes, secure your legacy, and create a thriving retirement, we can create a personalized, powerful plan for you for a flat fee with no hidden commissions, and there is no obligation for you to buy any products from us. If you want to know more, head on over to galenhelpsdocs.com. That's G-A-L-E-N helpsdocs.com. Read up on what it covers and click on the book a call button to book a free call to explore whether a custom flat fee plan is a good fit for you. And now on with the show. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a Clean Bill of Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Galen Nuttall, as always. And I'm joined by Dr. Matt Pointer, who we crossed paths and it made a lot of sense to do an episode. So to quickly give some background on Dr. Matt, as he's referred to on his website, uh, trained at McMaster and UBC, uh, spent 13 years in full-time emergency medicine. And in 2018, you left medicine to travel around the world for a year with your family. And after you came back, decided to dedicate yourself full-time to improving financial literacy, particularly among doctors. So definitely a lot to talk about. Uh, yeah. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Galen. It's good to be here. Absolutely. And it's kind of funny how we cross paths. Um, I won't go into the entire story, but the whole reason I know how to solve a Rubik's Cube is because uh, our kids met at school and one thing led to another and my daughter learned how she was inspired by your son and then she taught me how. So I never thought I'd learn how to solve a Rubik's Cube, but now I know. So that's awesome. It's it's so funny the way things happen. I actually first came across you. Uh, you were interviewed by a uh, mutual friend or acquaintance of ours, uh, Yathan uh, Chata, oh, yeah. who runs another great podcast called Beyond MD, which is yep. all about money for physicians. I think you did that a couple of years ago. And I that was my first introduction to you. I had no idea who you were. It was a great podcast interview. Uh, um, and then I was living in a small town about 40 minutes south of Belleville at the time. And I remember right. you saying that you were being interviewed from Belleville. And uh, I thought that was a coincidence. And then, but the coincidences continued from there. <laughs> uh, just this past summer, we moved up to Belleville. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and it just so happens that, uh, yeah, two of our kids are in the same class. And so, uh, yeah, so it's pretty cool. It's a, It's funny the way things go, I think, you know, it's a, it's a cliche to say it's a small world, yeah. but but it really is when you when you keep your eyes open and sometimes you cross paths with people who are in the same universe as you. Um, I'm a little bit newer to this universe of personal finance than uh, than you are, but um, but I feel really honored to to be here and doing stuff like this now, being kind of part of a a little tribe of people up here in Canada who are trying to do good work for people who want to improve their financial literacy. So, yeah. uh, so thanks for asking me to be here. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that was a very awesome episode. I did. Yeah. And was pretty early on in this podcast. I can't remember what episode we did, but I kind of stumbled upon his stuff. I wrote, listened to a couple episodes, wrote a review, reached out to him, recorded it, had a lot of fun doing that. Um, yeah, no, definitely a small world for sure. And I love what you're up to. I mean, I'm, I'm always a big fan of anyone educating Canadians more about finance because a lot of times doctors come to me and they've heard a lot about U.S. stuff. And they're like, because obviously it's bigger population and there's a couple of, you know, financial doctors who've been doing it for a long time. And then they come to me and they're like, how much of this applies in Canada? How much of this makes sense? And part of what I do is helping them figure that out. So it's awesome. More con more Canadian content, the better. Um, so I'd love to dive right into like how, so you've, you discovered some things for yourself, it seems like to me around finance and, you know, what it's like to, to, to you know, certain other things around being a practicing physician. And then you decide to turn around and help colleagues with that. So I'd love to start with, you know, what is one of the big ways that you support uh, Canadian physicians with uh, finances? Yeah, the biggest way that I um, am doing my best to support Canadian physicians with finances is through a course that I started uh, a little over a year ago called Money Smart MD. Um, and uh it's an online course. It's over Zoom. Uh, as far as I know, there's really not 
nothing else like it out there in Canada right now for physicians. And so I tried, because of that, I tried to keep the bar to entry as low as possible. So it's a four hour course. This is my little plug, I guess, uh, two hours per evening for two evenings, uh, live over zoom. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, uh, that's the course I started a little over a year ago. And, um, I never thought I would be doing this at this stage of my life. I thought I'd still be practicing uh, full-time emergency medicine, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I did for 13 years, as you mentioned. But you also mentioned that we did uh, that big trip around the world for a year as a family after 13 years. And, uh, and the way this course came into existence was when I got back or when we got back from that trip, um, a, uh, an acquaintance of mine who was the president of the Medical Staff Association at one of the big Toronto hospitals emailed me and said, uh, you know, I know you just did this big trip. I'd been interviewed by somebody for their uh, yeah. blog at the, uh, to kind of tell about that trip. And it's a little bit unusual to leave medicine after 13 years and do something like that. So he heard about my trip. He started following us. He contacted me when we got back and uh, he said, you know what? I also heard one of your finance talks that you gave for residents a couple of years ago. And I was wondering if you'd be interested in maybe putting a talk together for our medical staff association, mm -hmm. somehow weaving together those three themes of financial pearls that are important for physicians leaving medicine and also this big trip that you did around the world. And um, I'll admit that was, that was a pretty daunting task for me yeah. at the time. I don't really consider myself a natural public speaker, but, and this was like an hour long talk that he was mm -hmm. asking me to give. And so um, anyway, I worked on it for months uh, and, uh, and I gave the talk and it was like the response I got was just, amazing like it's um yeah it was just incredible like the feedback i got afterwards the emails and uh and this person actually a lot of your audience i think is our physicians oh, yeah. uh and so uh so his name is aaron sayal some people may know him um Anyway, he uh, he approached me afterwards and he said, you know what, Matt, this stuff is really important. And I think that there's a need out there for physicians to hear this kind of thing, particularly from another physician. Mm -hmm. And he and he's got an experience, uh, quite a bit of experience building his own course. He's been teaching for about 13 or 14 years now. And so he offered to be a support for me to build it into a course. And uh, I wouldn't have been able to do it on my own. So a huge amount of credit goes to Aaron. Uh, and uh, he's an ongoing uh, source of motivation and support <laughs> for me. Uh, and so that's really how the course came to be. Uh, so it's the Money Smart and D course and uh, and the four hour course really covering the foundations of how to help physicians become more financially uh, literate, mm -hmm. but start to feel more in control of their financial lives. Because as you and I both know, that is just one of the biggest levers that we can pull on in our lives in order to live better and also to help uh, fight burnout, which is, yep. we know is a huge problem right now uh, in healthcare. Um, so, um, so yeah, so in a nutshell, that's kind of the origin story of the course and what it's all about. Very cool. And like, so that's awesome that you, um, I mean, those different things that kind of coincided for you to start down that path of creating a course for physicians. And um, so what are some of the main things you'd say, like, uh, you know, you said that people got back to you and they had like a lot of really good feedback about the about the talk you gave. Um, so like, what are some of the things that you help people with or help understand uh, with uh, through the course that you do? Yeah, you know, uh, when you're building a course like that and you're trying to pack as much as you can into four hours, but at the same time, keep it from being overwhelming, yeah. uh, it's a challenge. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you can bring everybody up to speed on the really foundational essential concepts. But at the same time, you know that there's going to be some people who register for the course who already have background. And so you want to make sure that they get a lot out of the course as well. Um, so not long ago, I got an email from a physician, a gentleman who had taken uh, my, I think it was my last course. And, uh, and I remember him from the course. I remember looking at his face on the zoom screen and he was just like deadpan 
the whole time. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, crap. Like, this is one of these guys who has a lot of background knowledge already. And this is maybe too basic for him. And like, am I really getting through to him? Am I saying things that are important? I'm really not sure. And then when it came to like questions and answers and discussion, he had some questions that were pretty high level, really good ones. Uh, and so I did my best to address those questions. And then the second night came along and it was kind of the same thing. And I was like, you know, it didn't, that kind of thing didn't feel great. Like lots of great feedback from, from everybody else. And I could read their faces and see them nodding and like interacting and, and responding and everything. And so I really, I felt like I had maybe missed the mark. And and in my head, I'm like, well, that's, you know, it's maybe it's just going to happen sometimes. Yeah. And I just got to, got to get over it and move on. And uh, then I got the uh, evaluation from him and it was just like, just glowing. Mm. He just like, I completely misread the situation. <laughs> he wrote this big, long paragraph saying that he was, had been up until the course, he, well, he was totally disenchanted with this high fee, low level financial service that he had been getting in his particular situation. And that the course really helped bring so many things together uh, for him and really gave him not just the confidence, but clarity on how he can move forward, given that he did indeed have a lot of background knowledge already. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so that was just awesome to get. And then he emailed me again about a month after the course, um, because he had actually gone ahead and started making those changes and mm. started taking more control of his financial life. He'd been having these great conversations with his wife about it. And uh, he had a couple of little clarifying questions that he wanted to ask me, which I always invite people to do after the course. I really love hearing from people um, because as many of us discover sometimes, and you even mentioned this, sometimes it's very difficult uh you can search the internet for information yeah. that you're looking for, but it's hard to know what's relevant to your situation and what's not. So we had a couple of clarifying questions oh, yeah. uh, around that. So, uh, so to get that feedback uh, from him and then the follow-up as well, to see that he was actually able to um, put these um, uh, this information uh, and these kind of paths, keep on moving forward on these paths was pretty great. I mean, I, I know, as hard as I work, I'm only ever going to be a small piece in the puzzle for, mm. for everybody. But what I'm what I'm aiming for is to be maybe that little piece that links a whole bunch of other pieces together. And so it helps make sense of the picture. And so that these people who take my course and the people who I work with one on one as well um, can really start to see the big picture. And yeah. that allows them to, to move forward and really start improving things, not just from a dollars and cents point of view, but it actually... Yeah. As you know, as an advisor, it can have a real positive impact far beyond what your bank accounts look like. It can have a, mm -hmm. a really massive impact on the quality of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, we talked, I know we talked about that when we first talked before this episode um, about there's the dollars and cents, and then the, there's also quality of life, which, um, you know, is really the ultimate goal. Money can be a vehicle to do that. Now, yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the things I was curious is like, so I can't remember if I mentioned this to you or not, but I sent out a survey a couple of years back um, and I, I ended up, I think I ended up having about a hundred Canadian physicians answer the survey and most of them. And I, and I cite this often because I want anyone who feels the same way to know that they're not alone. The majority, uh, 50, more than 50%, I think it was 52 or 58% said that they were confused about their finances and they didn't know what to do. And well over, I asked a question, how efficiently do you think you're using your corporation? And I think over 80% said they either weren't sure if they were using it properly or they were sure they weren't using it properly. Very few said, I'm sure I'm using it properly. And I cite that because I feel like some people may, I think behind closed doors when I meet with physicians, sometimes they think, oh, all these other people have it all figured out and I don't. Mm -hmm. Whereas they're in the majority. <laughs> if if 100, you know, physicians uh, represent, you know, more or less a sample. So, like, what are some of the big things that you find people are confused about or wondering when it comes to uh, investing or finance? Like, are there are there some common themes that you find among among people that reach out to you? Mm. For sure, there are. I mean, I I think broadly speaking, there's two categories. There's the things that people 
know that they're confused about. And mm-hmm. then there's a whole bunch of other things that they don't necessarily know that they're confused about. Um, so, I mean, the things that people know that they're confused about is kind of being um, being clear about like the role of corporations, for example, mm-hmm. in your overall financial plan. That's definitely a, a big one in my experience as well. You know, should you prioritize investing in your RSP versus your TFSA versus your corporation if mm-hmm. you have one? Um, lots of people are confused um, when they're first starting out whether they should prioritize paying off their debt. Or okay. investing. Uh, many people uh, have questions about um, renting a house versus buying. Uh, and if they're going to buy a house, well, how much house can I really afford without screwing other things up? Um, so I think those are those are really uh, really common. Um, another one from uh, that I get the kinds of people who sign up for my course is they're entertaining the idea of, you know, do I need a traditional financial advisor or can I go the DIY route? Can I be a self-directed investor without mucking things up terribly? Uh, And so helping people go through that process and figuring out what the right answer for them is. Um, I mean, I am, I have been a DIY investor myself since I started earning a paycheck as a resident back in 2002. Um, And so that's the path that I've gone down. But uh, over the years, I've, I've realized, I used to think that, you know, everybody can do it if they just have yeah. A little bit of interest. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Now I realize that that's not actually true. There's there's a lot of physicians in particular out there um, where uh, you know things are complex enough, or they just don't have enough time or interest to really be able to do it effectively themselves. And uh, the kinds of mistakes that they may make along the way um, might be a lot more expensive than the fees they may pay to get yeah. some professional help. So I think that there's uh, there's multiple options open to people, but uh, but having clarity on what the right path is for you uh, is something that I help people uh, with quite a bit. And then, as I said, there's there's also the kind of uh, the the things that people might not necessarily uh, know that they need more clarity on or, or Mm -hmm. more clarity would help improve their life. And, uh, and for, for, that's a lot of what I talk about in the course, or maybe sometimes not talking directly about it in the course, but it's the backdrop to, to the course, which is how can you use money? Money itself is not the goal. Mm -hmm. Money is a tool that we can use in order to live a better life. And so understanding that is really important. It sounds maybe like a little new agey flaky, but it's actually has really very real uh, ramifications because like, for example, it's very easy. We get sent messages all the time in our culture that to be happy, just spend, 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 you know, the path to happiness is owning a Tesla, nothing against Teslas or anything, Mm -hmm. but, uh, but a Tesla is not going to make you happy or owning a house that's a thousand square feet bigger than what you already have. Um, and, uh, and if you don't pause and reflect and think about those things, then you can very easily get yourself into a very financially fragile situation that um, doesn't actually make you any more happy. It just makes you more stressed out and maybe ties you to a job that you're already working harder and longer at than you really want to. And you realize that with interest rates going up on your mortgage and car payments Mm -hmm. and things like that, now you're in a situation where you're forced to work even more. Um, And so understanding, understanding those dynamics and, and there's actually evidence behind what makes people happy, what actually adds to our happiness. And it has nothing to do with luxury cars or bigger houses. It has, and I talk about this in the course, it really has to do with what I call the four F's, Mm -hmm. which is spending time with your friends and family, taking care of your fitness, eating well and exercising, 
philanthropy, doing nice things for other people, even though you don't have to. I know it starts with a PH, but it sounds like an F. Uh, and then the last F is flow experiences. So those are kind of hobbies. People that might not be familiar with that term. So flow experiences are those yeah. things that you can lose yourself in for hours at a time. So um, sports or art or music or writing or things like that. It's those four things that really... Um, add to our sense of satisfaction with our lives. And they don't directly have to do with money, but certainly being able to um, achieve financial independence or get you on the path to financial independence can help you spend time on those things. So really an overarching theme of the course and the way that I think about money is to understand that the point of money is not about money. The point of money is to allow us to gain control over our time. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love it. I love the four Fs. Um, and you probably saw me smile when you said philanthropy, but I got it. It's awesome. <laughs> philanthropy. Um, yes, I yeah, know no. you do. What's that? I know you do got that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's awesome because, um, yeah, I mean, this is definitely a big part of, like when I became an advisor, I was kind of like, well, what's going to make me different from every other advisor out there? And it's also just my personal philosophy of like, yes, wealth is a tool, it's a means. And when I do, so I do fee-based planning sometimes where some people become my client by uh, hiring, well, some people just hire me to do a plan for them, right? And I can't do a plan for anyone unless I know what's most important to them. And we mm -hmm. pull out key, I pull out key words from the first call, which is a discovery call of like what they really want out of life. And freedom is almost always on that list. Like I'd say probably 80% of the time freedom is on the list and freedom to do, you know, usually it's people, the freedom to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And that's what retirement, retirement sounds like to a lot of people. And I always look for ways for people to achieve that pre-retirement because it can be a real long stick with a carrot at the end if you think you can't have these things until retirement. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I really, I really see that where when people have it sort of in, in somewhat of an alignment, it's like, oh, me not having to worry about, you know, doing locums in my 70s is going to free me up. Like, and when I can flip that switch, you know, what am, how am I going to spend my time differently? And like, not just um, going after the money for the money's sake, because what I have seen is if people go after just more, they never know when they're done. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I wrote a blog post uh, about a year ago about this quote unquote, one more year syndrome, mm -hmm. uh, where people, uh, and I mean, I think we've probably both seen it many times, um, where people think that they're just, they're going to feel better if they just reach a certain dollar amount in yeah. their investment accounts. And that's just, that's what they focus on. So money becomes the goal instead of the tool. And then they reach it and they realize, then they start thinking of all these other reasons why, oh, but what if this happens? And what if this happens? So I'll just work one more year. And, I'll, and then that this will be my level that I need to reach. And then I'll be happy. And it, the goalposts just keep on getting pushed further and further and down the road. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, as anybody who works in medicine knows, sometimes you run out of time before yep. you actually figure out that that was the wrong goal all along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of it has, does a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, identity, like anyone who works, a lot of their identity is wrapped up in what they do. Right. And I think for physicians, there may even be another level of that. I, I and partially, cause I think it's so hard to become a doctor, <laughs> like mm -hmm. at least in my opinion, uh, my story is that I gave up after about one one semester at Johns Hopkins pre-med was enough for me to be like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> but uh, it's so hard. And then it's so much of your identity. And then it's like, oh, when I go to retire, like, is it is am I giving up something that I'm not willing to give up yet? Uh, sort of a thing. And uh, it's a very interesting conversation to have with people to sort of go through that discovery. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, that, that's a that's kind of another uh, aspect of it as well as this whole idea of retirement, uh, particularly for physicians. And I think you're right, even more than other careers, I think so much of um, people's identities can get wrapped up in being a physician. I think there's lots of reasons for that. There's so uh, a huge amount of sunk costs involved. We spend yeah. a lot of money and a lot of time, uh, both in the educational phase and then actually working at being a physician for, for most of us anyway. Uh, and then also culturally, there's, there's kind of this expectation that being a doctor is going mm -hmm. to be like 
the thing that defines you. I I see that changing yeah. uh, over time, particularly for newer physicians coming out. And uh, personally, I think that that's a, a really good thing, given the landscape and the realities of delivering healthcare these days. I think the only way to do it, for most people at least, in a healthy way, is to find a way to do it in a balanced way. Um, but, uh, but the other thought I had as you were speaking there is you, you mentioned retirement, uh, and, uh, one thing that I've, one thing that I realized really when, uh, leading up to the trip that we took after 13 years of full-time emergency medicine, like I, I didn't get burnt out personally, but I could see burnout was on the horizon for me. This was not going to be the 30 year career that I thought it was going to be. Um, fortunately for myself and my wife, and we've got four kids, um, we had done enough things right financially uh, over the years, really a combination of a very simple but effective and evidence-based investment plan combined with uh, a relatively high savings rate. We didn't live, live a luxurious lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Really, at 13 years, it it gave us – we didn't have to feel trapped in our situation. Mm-hmm. We realized that we had choices. But it did require – a shift in how we thought about things because we had been investing in our corporation, RSPs and TFSAs, thinking that that money was earmarked for some luxurious lifestyle in our 60s. And it just reached a certain point, both in terms of dollar amounts in those accounts, but also reached a certain point in terms of how we were feeling about the direction our life was going, Mm -hmm. particularly in medicine for me, where we looked at that money and said, well, wait a second, like a luxurious retirement in my 60s is far less important to me than doing something a little bit crazy, but pretty important and exciting for us as a family now, like traveling around the world for a year with our four kids and and my wife. And so... um, and so, yeah, it realized it made me realize that uh, that we had choices, and um, and so I feel really fortunate that we were able to do to do something like that. Hmm. Yeah, and totally that um, that analysis of like what's going to be important later versus what's important right now, and uh, yeah. and being able to do it. Like, obviously, you took the steps to be able to do that, which is really cool. Um, yeah, and I, I think like there's there's a lot of you know traveling around the world with four young kids is not the right answer for everybody, of course. <laughs> but I think that a lot of people, a lot of physicians I talk to, they have something mm-hmm. that might seem a little bit wild and crazy to other people, but something in the back of their mind that they that's really important to them that that they really want to do, but they they're really afraid that they're never going to be able to do it, yeah. that they're going to be, they're going to be tied to their job, uh, forever. And they don't really understand the steps that they actually can take, that it's actually possible to, to do those things, to really live a life that's in line with your values mm-hmm. and do mm-hmm. the things that you think are, that you feel like are really the most important things to you. There's a way to do that, but it always involves money. We can't mm. escape it. It always yeah. involves uh, understanding money better and organizing your finances better. And so, so that's um, I feel honored to be in the position that I'm in that I can help clarify that for people and and maybe help them not necessarily show them every step of the path, yeah. but uh, but show them the right questions to ask and to illuminate the next couple of steps so that they can kind of get on their way in that direction. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, no, and I love, um, you know, you mentioned a few things that I wanted to circle back to, which is um, some of those, you know, when I asked you, what are the main things that people, uh, that physicians are wondering? And so one is the use of the corporation, right? Corporation versus TFSA versus RSP, which is like, you could write like a very thick book, (laughs) arguing every side of that, (laughs) every side of that thing, Um, which I mean, does bring me to something where I've also realized like a lot of people, like, you have to be okay with close enough is good enough sometimes. Like I feel like sometimes I come across and people are like, man, I want to run every possible mathematical scenario of this or this or this or this. And a lot of times you can spend a lot of time trying to get to that final, you know, perfect tweaking. And then it's like, well, one change of one tax law 
can completely change the whole thing. But anyways, it's um interesting because yeah, I they say perfect is the enemy of good. Yeah, exactly. Perfect is the enemy of good. And I literally have uh, I share these with clients sometimes, which is two articles by two well regarded accountants in Canada. One arguing uh, corporation, the other one arguing tax free savings account, and they're both completely mm-hmm. valid arguments with the different different uh, assumptions. Assumptions. Yeah. yeah. So it's like. It's like it's all based on assumptions. So until you bring it into the real world, you don't know what the real answer is. Uh, the other one was uh, pay off debt versus invest. Uh, that's a very fascinating one that, again, is very early on, uh, especially, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I've actually seen I've seen this at every level, really. Um, but it is fascinating uh, to look at, you know, like you said, especially with the sunk costs of medicine. A lot of physicians start off with a lot of debt. and They're just tired of it and they want to get rid of it. And, you know, I always say that there's the mathematical side and there's the emotional side. And you have to figure out the balance of like sometimes people do want to aggressively pay off their debt, even if it doesn't make a lot of sense numbers wise. And if they're okay with what they may be sacrificing, I'm like, go for it. And then the last one, which I wanted to talk a little about was choosing your path, which is, um, you know, are you going to be a DIY investor? Are you going to hire someone? Like, what does that look like? And it's pretty interesting because I did interview um, Dr. Mark Soth, who is the loony doctor. Yeah, he's fantastic. And I would have assumed that he didn't have an advisor. And then when I interviewed him, he's like, I have an advisor. I use an advisor. Mm -hmm. And he didn't Mm -hmm. say exactly in what capacity and everything. But I was like, whoa. And then I saw a post by the White Coat Investor a little bit ago where he said that he uh, guesses that as many as 80% of physicians uh, could benefit from working with an advisor in some capacity. And I was like, oh, Mm -hmm. like, you know, these people like, I mean, that the White Coat Investor literally has a course called Fire Your Financial Advisor. (laughs) But he says a lot of doctors could benefit from it. So what do you think are like some of the big... Like, what are the big signposts, like, you know, I guess, like, um, what's the big evidence there of, like, if someone's, someone can go down the do-it-yourself path or not go down the do-it-yourself path or, like, somewhere in between, like, what do you kind of discover about people in that discovery of, like, choosing the path? Yeah, so, um, I think that in order to be a successful uh, DIY or self-directed investor, um, you really need to uh, have three things. I mean, number one, you need to care about this stuff. And for somebody who has zero interest in this, uh, you know, it's it's really a, a non-starter. Um, so, uh, and then the second thing is that you need to have confidence. And, um Confidence is really the tricky one. You know, to to gain confidence, you really need to be able to engage in a process of educating yourself and being able to sort out the good information from the bad information, the relevant information from the irrelevant information. And uh, I think you and I are both trying to do our parts to help people with that process. But you do need to be confident. If you're not confident, then you're not going to be able to sleep at night. And that's going to just undermine the whole point of doing this in the first place. Uh, and then the last thing is you need to have the, uh, be able to carve out the time. So I think of them as the three C's. Uh, you need to care about this stuff. You need to have confidence and you need to carve out the time. Um, and carving out the time, I mean, I, I like talk kind of reassuring people that uh, I'm all, I am all about a simple approach. I think as I think it's Warren Buffett or maybe Charlie Munger says simplicity has a way of improving returns by allowing you to better understand what you're doing. And so a simple evidence-based approach uh, is really within the grasp of any physician I've ever talked to who also has an interest in this stuff uh, and is willing to carve out the time uh, in order to gain the confidence over time as well. Uh, And so it really doesn't need to, uh, in terms of the time that it takes to get up and running, well, that's one thing. There's a learning curve there. That's going to take you some time and effort to educate yourself. But once you've got things up and running, a lot of physicians are kind of surprised to learn that, you know, updating and maintaining your plan, um, I suggest just doing it annually. It's usually a bad idea for people to be keeping tabs on their investments like every week or two weeks or whatever. That usually just leads to bad behavior. So um, it's very, very feasible for a lot of people to adopt a plan that is simple, but also very, very effective. That really does not take much time at all. Yeah, I love it. The three C's. 
Yeah, definitely. Like you have to care about it. Like I've met, I met, so it's funny thing is I've met physicians who it's like, they wish they could do, do it yourself. They're like, Oh, I wish I were that kind of person. Or I wish I were like that. And I'm like, you can still be successful. Like plenty of DIY people are going to be completely successful in their endeavors. They're going to retire. They're going to be great. They're going to use their corporation effectively. And plenty of non DIYers who end up hiring advisors are going to do completely great as well. And I'm like, but there are like there is that spectrum. And like I had a really funny example of this recently where someone booked a call with me and they wanted to know my cert, what, what I do and everything. And they sent me like everything ahead of time, how much money they had, what kind of insurance they had, how much money was in their corporation, like da, 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 da. And I was like, all right, like, sure. And we like we hopped on a call. And at, at the end of the call, I said, look, I don't think you can benefit from anything I do in the sense that like you are so interested in doing this yourself and you're so dedicated to learning more. And he was really well on track. I mean, like back of the napkin was like, you're going to be okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's like, okay, well, cool. And then like three weeks later, I got a call, I got, someone else booked a call and they're like, Galen, I really want to work with you with my investments. And I was like, okay. I was like, how'd you find out about me? And they named the do, do, DIY guy <laughs> like oh, as on. the guy who told them to come talk to me. And oh, I was like, cool. really? So I reached back to him and I was like, thanks for introducing those people to me. And he's like, yeah. He's like, I meet people. And I'm a big fan of DIY and I tell them how I do it and what I do. And when I see their eyes glaze over, I'm like, all right, never mind. Like, go talk to Galen and see see what he can talk about. So I thought that was a pretty cool, like, real life example of like the DIY guy who was like, not everyone has to do it the way, you know, that he's decided to do it. Um, right. So, yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, it's... um it's important also to realize that just like doctors, just like teachers, just like any other profession, not all financial advisors are created equal. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and certainly, you know, a lot of people get kind of attached to a financial advisor who is not necessarily following an evidence-based approach, uh, not providing full service, you know, is, is maybe only interested, like the meetings are not comprehensive financial planning. They're really only about, well, how can we switch around your investments this year mm -hmm. uh, to try to beat the market? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, and if that is the extent of the service that they're offering, then, um, then I think it's, it's, you know, those people need to make a change one way or another. They might not go 100% DIY, but I still think it's really important for them to get more educated so that they can then interview another financial advisor yeah. uh, to find one that's actually going to help them uh, help meet their needs. Uh, so no matter what, whether you have a financial advisor or not, it is so helpful to have at least a baseline knowledge oh, around absolutely. personal finance and investing. It's, I, I would say it's really an essential life skill. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's a good point. Like not all advisors are created equal. Like I'm, uh, I'm thinking, uh, well, I'm like, oh, if someone sits in front of me, I'm going to take them through a process first and foremost to see if we're a good fit. That's always like the first thing if we're a good fit. And yeah, there's definitely like, oh yeah, like not a lot of absolutes, like when it comes to these things, but there's the absolute of if your advisor either uh, thinks they can beat the market or insinuates that they can be that they think their job is to beat the market, yeah. then it's like, oh, man, like, what are they actually doing? And I certainly have met, I feel like there's way less than before. Like, I feel like, I mean, I wasn't around in like the 90s, but I feel like 90s and pre 90s, it was all about like, oh, yeah, my guy knows like, what good things to pick and they're going to pick the good things like that's the sense i got from my parents stockbroker growing up was like oh yeah gold is going to do really well or blah blah is going to do really well <laughs> and now i don't think many people can get away with like publicly saying that they think that's their job but i've definitely met people who they think that that's the, their advisor's job I'm like oh no he's got like some real serious insight into the way this company's headed or the way that company's headed and it's like wow totally not evidence-based obviously um well it, but it's still it's it's out there all over the place yeah. in fact i mean i i won't mention I won't mention a name at all, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but I actually, about a year and a half ago or so, um, like a lot of physicians do, I got this email uh, kind of uh, saying there's this free educational webinar about retirement planning for physicians. Um, sign up here. So like, you know what? I'm, I'm blogging now. I'm teaching this course. And like, I... I 
I'm just going to sign up for this. I just want to see. It's been like 10 years since I've been to one of these things. I'm going to I'm going to see what 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 this is like. And so I signed up for this webinar, and it was all that. It was this guy who was um, and lots of experience, lots of years under his belt. And uh, we get we get emails. Uh, I'm sure, like I'm just one of thousands of doctors on this email sure. list from this particular uh, person on a very regular basis. But his whole thing was, yeah, you give your money to me, I can beat the market. He showed all these graphs, which in the fine print, if you read it, it said that this is not accurate. Like he actually admitted to real world experience, but real slick sales pitch. And, and that was his entire thing. Didn't mention fees anywhere. So I emailed him afterwards and I said, what what are your fees like? And, uh, and it was like somewhere between two and 4% per year. And he didn't even do comprehensive financial planning. Wow. It wasn't really about retirement planning. It was, he was just an investment manager promising, Promising, making promises that he's not not going to be able to keep, but a real slick sales pitch, and uh, and wow. so um, I wrote a uh, an article about that. Uh, it's on my the blog section of the Money Smart MD uh, website uh, as well. There's um, I, I can't remember the exact title right now, but Undercover is in the title if you search <laughs> for that under there. Um, and uh, it, it, there's really like ten red flags that I counted in that presentation, and so I kind of go through them one by one in the article. But uh, that got picked up by the Medical Post as well. They they liked that little yeah. <laughs> expose. <laughs> yeah. Well, definitely. Yeah, and it's a good point. It's a good point. Like there are different people. Like there there are advisors, and I mean advisors. I'm lumping in stockbrokers and investment salesmen and, and investment. Yeah. I mean, you can lump them all together, and there's certainly some that simply don't know. Like they either don't know or are they uh, they're either it's either willful ignorance or pure ignorance that they actually think they can do this um yeah. and i'm like anyways it just doesn't make sense so i mean i i say that until an investment advisor can not only admit but embrace the fact that their job is not to time the market they can't get to the real job of financial planning absolutely and and because yeah. that's what they're tied up in they're not doing what they really need to do which is a lot of what i believe we talked about which is like aligning people's goals with their finances making sure people have those goals at all like that that can be can be um how do i put it like i found a fun way to do it with people but like sometimes people are a little hesitant to like really voice those goals in, in case they're too ambitious or too you know like oh you know i've met with people i've met with physicians who are like well when do you want to retire and they're like well i'm going to say 65 because that's what everyone says and i'm like well what if you didn't listen to everyone? Like, what if you just said when you want to retire? And they're like, actually, I'd really like to retire at 55. And I was like, well, can we just punch that number in and see if you're on track or not? And if you're not, what it would take to get there? And they're like, yeah, okay, fine, fine. But they were like resisting it, right? Because they're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to say 55. <laughs> it seems too young or whatever. So yeah, yeah, that's definitely a big part of it, which you talked about, which is the, um, and that whole, the, I mean, we didn't have a chance to talk about it, but that whole uh, uh, um, idea of flow, uh, I'm a huge fan of that, like helping people discover what's, um, what's most, where, where they enter that flow state, which like time stands still and like, yeah. just, just like and, in the zone. And, and it's I awesome. mean, so one of the questions I ask people who take my course is, uh, you know, how many of you, I get, I get them to raise their hands. How many of you feel like you have enough time in the average day to even get done all the things that need to get done oh, man. and no hands ever no go hands, up. Yeah. And so physicians in particular are constantly living in a state of time famine yeah. uh, and uh, rather than time affluence. And there's actually some really fascinating research and literature on um, on that. But in, in a nutshell, living in a constant state of time stress is terrible for your mental health. It's terrible for your physical health. It's terrible for your relationships as well. The bottom line is that being constantly time stressed is as bad for us as being unemployed. That's what the um, research says. Yeah. And and that's the norm amongst physicians. A lot of physicians oh, yeah. even wear it as a badge of honor. Like I'm just yeah, busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Yeah. I'm so busy. Like busy I can't, is a badge of honor, yeah. Yeah. And it's uh and I I really feel an obligation to um to speak against that. And and a lot of but there's a lot of physicians out there who know that that's not healthy, who know that that's not good. Um, so I try to also give them a voice and to yeah. validate that for them and say, you know what, 
there's another way. That was a path I didn't want to go around. I did things a little bit differently. This is how I did it. Uh, this is, you know, here's some steps that you might take uh, that that you might find will make a big difference in your quality of life. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a pretty fun uh, fun role to be in for me. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Yeah, like I heard, I, I interviewed a doctor once who said that the this phrase was thrown around the break room a lot, which is lunch is for the week. Or it's like <laughs> you shouldn't have time to even stop and eat or whatever. But like, you know, I love that you're really practicing what you preach and um, the ripple effect of working with physicians. I believe, like, if a physician, like you're saying, is free of this time constraint idea that's like really hounding them, then they're going to be more relaxed around their patients. Patients are going to yes. get better care. Like the ripple that's effect a really it important has point. in it's the absolutely community. True. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's always what crosses my mind. I mean, part of the reason I work with physicians is because my dad is one, and I personally mm -hmm. saw him, in my opinion, going through most of his practice without really great advisors around him. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm. He's in the state, so I can't be his advisor, but. I'll, st I'll still clean up things here and there that I'm like, ah, like, <laughs> I don't think this is right. But uh, yeah, no, that ripple effect is awesome of what you're up to and helping uh, physicians have peace of mind or other finances. Very cool. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you yeah, so much for being for on me, the Galen. podcast. Yeah, this is fantastic. And I want to make sure people know where to find out about these resources. You've mentioned blog, you mentioned a course. I want to make sure 100% that everyone's got that. And I'll post the link wherever I share this. So uh, is it all at moneysmartmd.com? Is that the place to find it all? Yeah, so uh, moneysmartmd.com is uh, is uh, the course website. And there is a blog on there. I've got... Um, uh, favorites page on there with kind of a curated list of resources Very from cool. the internet uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and all the blog and all that that stuff that's all free um, if anybody has any questions they can email me through the website there but it's just moneysmartmd at gmail.com um, I do also work with people one-on-one -on -one, specifically people who uh, really want to take that the path of becoming a self-directed uh, DIY investor I don't advertise that on the Money Smart MD course. I really want people to know mm -hmm. that that course is really meant to stand on its own merits. It's not an advertisement for anything else. I've just learned over the years that, you know, a course isn't enough for a lot of people. A lot of people need one on one help, yeah, uh, as we've been discussing tonight, actually. Um, uh, so I, I do also provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring for people who want to become effective DIY investors and really manage everything on their own. Um, and so, uh, so they can get in contact, just email me if anybody's interested in that. Uh, but, um, yeah, uh, I do have another website as well that I've been running for four years now. It's more about the investing side of things. It's called dividendstrategy.ca. Uh, and, uh, I know we have, don't have time today to get into that, which which is which is perfectly fine, but uh, that's really where I get most of uh, my interest on the mentoring side of things, and I have a lot more um, uh, information on uh, on that site about what the mentoring process uh, looks like. Very cool, awesome. Well, be sure to check out MoneySmartMD.com and DividendStrategy.ca to learn more about what Doctor Matt's up to and what resources you have. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Thank you, Galen. It was fun. All right. Take care. Take care. Thank you so much for having joined me on this episode of a Clean Bill of Wealth podcast. I truly appreciate you taking the time to do so. It really warms my heart to see the numbers of people listening to each episode go up, and it's just a lot of fun. Be sure to check back through past episodes to find insight on everything from more efficient charting practices to better sleep for physicians and much more. If you'd like to make sure you're leveraging your corporation effectively for taxes, retirement, legacy, and other financial matters important to physicians, please head on over to galenhelpsdocs.com to check out the work that we do with fee-based planning. Our fee-based plans are powerful, customized to you, and there's no requirement to buy products from us and no hidden commissions. You get clear, unbiased recommendations based on our expertise, helping hundreds of incorporated Canadians, just like you, create their ideal financial life and future. Again, it's galenhelpstocks.com. Click on the book a call button at the top for a quick and free conversation to find out whether fee-based planning makes sense for you. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care and see you at the next episode.